It has been an incredible week for SpaceX over the past seven days. They have achieved some incredible results. First and foremost, with Flight 10, which was supposed to launch Sunday, didn't because of a ground issue, then was supposed to launch Monday, didn't because of weather, but finally launched on Tuesday, and what a successful launch it was. They were able to achieve all of their goals with this flight, and hallelujah, it is about time that we start getting some data about these different heat shield experiments. We'll get to more on that a little bit later. Although it was a little bit slow getting off the pad, that's okay, because there's only one more of this generation of booster left before they move on to the more powerful version of the booster. I really want to acknowledge some of the incredible views that were brought to us by SpaceX and the Vader team, led by our own Photon Empress. And these graphics that we're getting here are great. I really appreciate these graphics, especially the one in the bottom left corner there, showing the orientation of the, the entire stack during the flight. This is awesome. Absolutely gorgeous views. Everything went according to plan when it came to Miko and ignition of the second stage. The hot fire staging worked well, and once again, the uh, on-purpose uh, flow of the hot staging was able to flip the booster into its correct orientation right off the bat, with a little bit of assistance from its RCS thrusters, but way more efficient than what they were doing before. And once again, that works. Even during the boost back burn and the landing burn, they were trying to test out more ways to uh, destroy the booster on purpose, finding out where its failure modes would be in. And according to this, th things went perfectly fine. And it really makes me wonder if they could have attempted to catch this and succeeded. However, whether or not they want to is another story because there's only one booster of this generation left before moving on to the more powerful boosters. Another big moment that uh, I was certainly anxious for, as well as many, many others, was Seco, second engine stage cutoff. Apparently went perfectly fine. Love how they cut away at the last second there, just in case there was any explosions. But no, once again, big love for these new graphics, the orientation of the spacecraft, and a little marker of where it currently is in relation to the Earth. I love that. And finally, one of the big things that I was looking forward to was these dummy Starlink deployments. Now, I gotta say that this shot was super eerie to me, seeing whatever this gas is float around inside of the payload bay there. Uh, it was definitely very eerie. I'm still not 100% sure what that gas is, but I'm actually really grateful for this gas being there because right there, we got to see exactly when the payload bay door started to open up, which successfully did open and they were able to successfully deploy these dummy Starlinks, all in a suborbital trajectory, so no worry about those being a piece of space junk. They all re-entered and re-entered over the ocean, so no big deal. Not gonna lie though, I was really confused by this deployment sequence at first while watching this live, thinking that something had gone wrong at this point and it had gotten stuck and thus had to be rolled back and tried again. I didn't realize that there was actually two of them, which is obvious looking at it again now, uh, that there's two stacks of these in the same rows. So one gets shot out, then they pull back and shoot out the other one. So <laughs> a little bit embarrassed of that while watching. Uh, watching live, but it makes a lot more sense now. However, I thought this shot was hilarious. <laughs> Bonk, getting hit on the way out. <laughs> This was a huge step though. This alone means that they can start when they're ready to do operational Starship launches with version three Starlink, potentially increasing their capacity, increasing their speeds and increasing their business, which means more money coming in for the Starship program and all sorts of other really cool stuff that SpaceX wants to do. Also, another important test that hasn't been completed yet was this engine relight or reignition of one of the Raptor engines, which is very important for deorbital maneuvers. The big reason they've been doing these suborbital flights this way is so they don't have one of these starships 
in orbit as a piece of uncontrolled space junk and having no control whatsoever about where it comes down. And it's big enough that it could cause some damage on the ground depending on where it might re-enter over. So it's a pretty big deal and actually quite responsible of SpaceX to not contribute to the space junk problem despite them having more than two-thirds of all orbital satellites right now, there are even those are being deorbited responsibly, as are all of their upper stages for the Falcon rocket. So this is just another reason to do their testing this way. Now, re-entry wasn't without some of its issues and problems. We saw them. I'm not sure if that was tiles that getting blown off or just fobs and pieces of ice. We saw this a couple of times, actually, before even seeing an explosion in the aft section. I'm not even sure we should call it an explosion because it's, although caused damage, didn't cause catastrophic damage and seemingly didn't cause any damage to the engines. Somehow, despite this happening, they were able to be okay somehow. That's a lot of debris. However, it looks mostly to me like insulation and not necessarily chunks of metal for some of it. However, there's obvious damage that was done, not just to the aft section, but to the flaps nearby as well, or at least one of the flaps on that side. Despite that, they were able to still re-enter no problem. Well, maybe some problems, but successfully re-enter. Holy cow. I was certainly nervous for a little bit that seeing this amount of debris coming off, that uh, Starship might not have made it. But that wasn't the case. God, so many pieces of debris. Oh my gosh. It just kept getting worse. Oh my gosh. So, so many pieces of debris. Oh my god. This shot right here really warped my mind. I did not understand what was happening for a second. It almost looks like the plasma and debris is being sucked into engine labeled E6 right there. Just, just a visual illusion, <laughs> but it certainly looks really trippy. All right, Whew. one last look at that bit of debris coming off of that flap. Ooh. However, on the bottom right of your screen, this is something that many have asked for and SpaceX finally delivered on. The G-meter. How much G-forces is the ship experiencing so that we, the people, can have an idea of how much Gs we might experience someday flying on this thing? Thank you, SpaceX. Thank you, Vader team. Thank you, Photon Empress, for delivering. We love it. Please keep doing it. Everything went well for re-entry and the big final moment of seeing its flip maneuver and seeing its landing burn before splashing down in the ocean, in the Indian Ocean, near Australia. Ah, it was finally good to see this sight again, but what the heck? What is that? What is all that orangeness going on on that thing and white on top? What is, what is this, SLS? Has Starship been SLS this whole time? What? What? So let's talk about this image. Let's talk about what is going on here with all of this weird discoloration. Orange on the bottom, white on top. What is going on? I'm going to admit my first theory was that this had something to do with the actively cooled heat shield tiles. Like, <laughs> I mean, this isn't a good example. This isn't rocket science, but I mean, that's what my antifreeze looks like in my car when I need to replace it. I know they're not using antifreeze and Freon, but that was my first initial thought of like, oh, that looks like used antifreeze. <laughs> Responding to Eric Berger, Elon Musk was actually able to clarify that this was not the actively cooled tiles causing all of the orange coloration, but rather metallic tiles, one of the ones that were a different type of material that they were wanting to test out, which is a lot coming from just a handful of tiles. It's looking like there was only one to three of these tiles that were metallic like this to cause all of that orange, but the white on top, that was... 
<laughs> from the insulation underneath the heat shield tiles because a few of the tiles were removed entirely and exposed. Uh, that insulation was exposed during reentry. So just really wild to see sites like that. And I'm very much hoping that this was in the, the test category and that won't be a permanent site because after just one flight, Starship is going to look like an old beat up rust bucket if they look like that in the future after just one flight. Yikes. Now, that was just Starship. That was on Tuesday of this week. In between their launch attempts for that, on Monday, they launched a satellite for Luxembourg, the NAUS spacecraft, which is, I guess, a spy satellite. But it was also a rideshare mission that had several other missions on board. So quick pause in between uh, Starship launch attempts to do a Falcon 9 flight. And of course, they had several Starlink missions this week as well. One of those Starlink missions conducted the 400th successful landing of one of these Falcon 9 boosters on a drone ship. They have more landings than that, but 400 landings, successful landings on a drone ship, which is absolutely crazy. And then on another Starlink launch, they were using their king of boosters, booster 1067. That's its serial number, and it launched and landed Ended for the 30th time, now being the record holder of the most amount of flights from just one booster, which is crazy to think about. That one rocket has flown more times than several other rocket programs out there and is getting close to the flight rate of some of the space shuttles. And now SpaceX is aiming for 40. Will they get there with booster 1067 or with the other boosters? Someday, I believe they will. Absolutely crazy. So yeah, big week for SpaceX. Congratulations to all of the engineers in both the Starship program and the Falcon program to achieve these crazy awesome milestones. And yes, this was just a suborbital launch of Starship, testing out these systems again, trying to find out more failure modes, testing out the heat shield tiles, and... It all brings up the question of what comes next for Starship. Well, there's one more booster and one more ship of this Block 2 configuration. So it's probably going to be another suborbital flight looking for more failure modes. But first, going over all of this data from the heat shield tiles making improvements, possibly conducting more tests on other types of heat shield materials, and trying to refine that system. So most likely for Flight 11, we're going to see the last of the version 2 boosters and the last of the version 2 starships before moving on to version 3 or block 3. And that means that Flight 12, which will be the first of the configured flights of version 3 block 3, it's probably going to be another suborbital flight because all all this stuff that they've been testing kind of has to be redone again to make sure that all of their upgrades work for version 3. We had a lot of high expectations for version 2, block 2, and yet we see the result of their flights. The last three having been kind of disastrous and quite a bit of a setback for the program. But now it feels like SpaceX is back on track. The next big steps of an actual orbital flight fully in orbit. We might see that on flight 13 of a full orbital flight, possibly flight 14. But Elon also said, responding to Everyday Astronaut, that the Starship catch at the tower was probably going to be somewhere between flight 13 to 15, depending on how well the version 3 flights go. So if the first flight of version 3 is a complete disaster, that's going to be pushed back. However, in order to do a ship catch at the launch tower, it's going to need to go fully into orbit, or at least such a high suborbit that it would still come back to the same trajectory nearby Starbase. <sighs> I feel so relieved that this flight went successfully and that we can look forward to new goals and aspirations with future flights until this system becomes fully operational, or at least partially operational, and starts flying Starlink missions. 
Next, they're going to have to figure out the bigger payload deployment system for bigger payloads, which looks like it's probably just going to be this door that they've shown on their renders of their Mars landers. So yeah, at the very least, they need to start testing that bigger payload door. So yeah, I am very much looking forward to the next steps that the Starship program takes. What do you guys think, though? Do you think that Flight 11 is going to happen really soon, like in a matter of weeks? Could it happen in September? Or will it more likely happen in October, even November or December, based on what they want to do with heat shields and things like that? What do you think, though? Right now, I'm predicting either late September or early October but, you know, willing to wait longer if they have some exotic experiment planned. Well, thank you very much for watching this quick review of Flight 10 and the amazing accomplishments that SpaceX has achieved just this week alone. <laughs> Man, I really appreciate your guys' support and would love it if you would give this video a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so that you're notified anytime we upload a new video. I'd like to thank all of our YouTube members who are keeping this show going and would highly encourage you to support us as well if you can. We have tiers as low as a dollar a month and every little bit helps us to produce more content and hopefully do some really cool things in the future. Thank you again for watching. My name is Space Mike, and until the next time I see you guys, keep moving onwards and upwards, and don't forget, Ad Astra, to the stars.